Men and women both have emotions, but they use them differently because one is more like the ant and one is more like the lion. Did you know that women are twice as likely to suffer from depression and anxiety as men? Why? Because what do we tend to do with our emotions? You're like, well, don't they come out all the time? No, actually, most women internalize stress. That's what the studies on, de on depression and anxiety tell us. They just keep pushing it down and pushing it down, pushing it down. You know what men do? They go and they find something to hit with a stick. They go and like act out on something. They do a project. They run around the block, something like that. They externalize pressure in a way that women don't. We both have emotions. We just use them differently. This whole idea that women are more emotional than men is ridiculous for anyone who has ever sat and watched a professional football game with a man. <laughs> I have watched professional football my entire adult life. Do you know what I have never done? I have never thrown the remote at the TV. <laughs> so who can't control their emotions? <laughs> Men and women may, mo may both be doctors, but they will approach medicine in different ways. Uh, so don't you think that in the healthcare profession we need both men and women doctors? And here's how I know that there are not yet enough women doctors or women in medical research. Would you like to know how I know this? Because if the device that is used to detect breast cancer were the same device that was used to detect testicular cancer, <laughs> we would have had a new device two decades ago. Men and women process the world differently because we are either embodied females or embodied males. This is why on Mother's Day, most of you are very careful in your churches to acknowledge infertility and infant loss. And on Father's Day, we don't talk about it. Because women bear that in their flesh. I want you to think for a second about what the implications might be about the way that women understand the gospel as a result of being embodied females. And I apologize if this makes you uncomfortable. Women's bodies every 28 days tell them a parable about the shedding of blood for the renewing of life. You don't think that changes the way that we encounter the scriptures? Men only bleed when something is wrong. So, what should we take from this as people who have the opportunity to lead in the church? Well, I think we need to ask two questions. We need to ask, what do we need from women as a church? And then we need to ask, what do women need from us? First, what does the church need from women? Church needs their unique perspective. It needs it in decision making. Women think differently than men do. The idea that it is not good for the man to be alone is something that we should pay attention to. Anybody remember how long ago it was that women got the vote? I know this is a date burned into your memories. Anybody know what year we got the vote? 1920. 1920. Interestingly, women were not allowed to serve on juries for a long time after that. In fact, as late as 1962, there were still three states in which women were not allowed to serve on juries, which meant that if a woman came to trial uh, on a charge of having killed her husband in self-defense because he was abusing her, that was going to be tried by an all-male and, by the way, all-white jury and heard by, an all -male, and heard by a male judge. So women got the vote in 1920, so not even 100 years ago. And before women had the vote, the predominant reason that people said, well, they don't need the vote was because, well, their husbands will vote according to what they need them to. And the poor single woman is over in the corner going, what about me? But since women received the vote, we've seen things like the Family Medical Leave Act, WIC, divorce law has been improved upon. Uh, before women had the vote, if, uh, uh, in many cases, only the husband could sue for divorce. And if he divorced her, he kept all of the assets and he kept the children. She couldn't get a loan either. Domestic violence laws have come to the foray and women's health. So listen to this. This is an interesting statistic, an interesting story here. During World War I, more American women died in childbirth than American men died on the battlefield, okay? 
So in 1921, so one year after women got the vote, suffragists pushed through the Shepherd Towner Act, which was to make sure that proper health standards were observed in labor and delivery. Almost overnight, infant and maternal death rates dropped 16% and 12% respectively. By the time those babies were having babies of their own, maternal fatalities were down over 70%, primarily because of women's ability to influence public policy. Why had this never come up before? Why had this not been addressed before? Because in all of human history, do you know who's never died in childbirth? A man. Does this mean that men are terrible people? No, it means that we pass through life as embodied males and as embodied females, and it is not good for the man to be alone. The help that the woman has to offer is essential and indispensable. Now, what I hope you are asking yourself right now is, if all I'm getting input for in my church setting is coming from men, what gaps do I have? Because since women do not outgrow vulnerability, they will tend to have eyes for the powerless, the marginalized, and the weak a little faster than you might. And if you don't believe me, look at the number of women who are doing foreign missions relative to the number of men. Women are going to have eyes for the powerless. Not only that, but in the counseling room, a woman who is in an abusive situation is not going to open up to two elders because she already doesn't trust men. She's being abused by one. She won't even report what's happening to you in terms you can diagnose. She might say, well, he has an anger problem. And then we too often respond with, well, what are you doing? Like, what's your role in that? Where's your sin in this? Assuming that there's some equal balance of responsibility that's going on there. And when we say that to her, we have just told her exactly what her abuser has been telling her. You know why I get angry at you? You make me. You know who she's more likely to tell her story to? A woman. And not necessarily just your wife. A woman who has formal authority to speak into the process, who can be a true advocate for her. Don't tell her to just bring her friend. Her friend's going to be intimidated by you too. Okay. So we need their input. They are going to have eyes for things that we might say are secondarily important, and they're saying, no, 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 this is really important. So if the women of your church keep coming to you with the same requests and you keep telling them we're pushing that down the line a little bit longer, ask yourself, are they seeing something that maybe I'm not? Second, we need women's relational capital. Women are connectors, as we just saw on the screen behind me. They are able to connect to one another. They are able to connect families to the church. They're able to connect friends to the church. Um, women like a lot of relationships that are, maybe some of them are deep and some of them are not deep, which is why if you're a church that has a pure groups model and you keep telling them go deeper with few, they're dying inside. They want to know more than the 10 or 12 people who are in their home group. In fact, they're designed to know more. And when someone in their home group is in crisis because they have the spider web of relationships, they're able to trigger the web and help comes running for that person who's in need. We need their relational capital. They do something for the local church. And third, we need their visible leadership. How visible? As visible as your church's complementarianism allows. The more restrictively you read the scriptures, the more focus you should give to cultivating women leaders in the areas that your interpretation does allow. We need to make participation as easy as possible for women in leadership. We need to look for ways that they can flourish and be visible. Why? Why is it important for us to have them in visible leadership? I would argue that it is very important for the next generation of women who are coming along, but don't miss this. It's equally important for the next generation of men. They need to see them valued and deployed in visible ways. You know, one of the most important things that I do when I travel around the country and teach the Bible is actually not that I teach the Bible. It's that I show up looking like a woman and teach the Bible. Because a lot of women only see men do that. So do you know how they perceive themselves as students of the Bible? They don't. They see that as a passive learning environment where I take in what someone else has told me the text says. We need women in visible leadership places. Okay, I could talk about this for days. Let's move on. What women need from the church? Women need to be shepherded. 
that should seem obvious, right? But like over half your church are women, and we've just said that men and women are not interchangeable. And too often as complementarians, we acknowledge that men or women are different, but then we disciple them as though they are exactly the same. We need to have single gender learning environments specifically, but just single gender environments in general, where women can gather as women and can develop relationally along lines that are helpful to the women and also to the church. But you, as the person who shepherds them, need to know what shapes their thinking. This is very important. Do you know what trends in the marketplace are attracting them? Do you know anything about essential oils? What messages are women drawn to? What voices do they listen to? Do you know what books and blogs your women are reading, both secular and sacred? Can you name 10 dominant female Christian voices on the internet or in the women's section of the Christian bookstore? I could do it for you in 30 seconds. Do you know the message that each of these women is communicating? Which female bloggers, writers, and teachers are faithfully pursuing women toward godliness? Make it a point to educate yourself on the voices that are speaking to your women the loudest and help point them toward those voices, both male and female, that they can trust. Women need to be shepherded. And here's the problem, because when women hear these voices only outside the church, right? When they don't see any visible female leadership in the church, is it any surprise that those voices would have such a loud carry with them? Women are looking for mothers in the church, and if they don't find them in your church, they will look elsewhere, and they will not ask your opinion. And because, in most cases, women have only been given a feeling faith and not a thinking faith, they will not objectively measure the message they are hearing. They will ask, do I like her? And then when she says something that is crazy talk, that is not orthodox belief, because they've only been resourced at the feelings level, they will have to reconcile how they feel about her to what she's saying instead of what they think about what she said. And so they will say, you know what, I just like her so much, so I guess what she said is okay. We need mothers in the church. (laughs) Okay, Um, women need to be leveraged. Second, women need to be leveraged. Women are leaving complementarian churches because they believe a theological trait is necessary for them to be able to serve in meaningful roles. They're wrong. If they were right, I would not still be a complementarian. But because our practice is broken, they think our theology is broken. There should be complementarian practice that so demonstrates the equal value and worth of women that no one questions it. If Deborah or Hulda were a member of your church, would she have a place to exercise her gifts? We must actively help these women find their places. Because most churches are almost entirely male-led, it is very hard for women in the church to find advocacy and mentorship because we're so fastidious about the way we relate to the opposite sex. In fact, you could argue that the way that most pastors are taught to think about the opposite sex is only as a potential sex partner. But do you know what the New Testament says about men and women? The paradigm is brothers and sisters. And if your only concept of a relationship with a woman who is not your wife is that she is someone you might accidentally sleep with, you have a shriveled understanding of male-female relationships in the church. It's all softballs today, isn't it? All right. We must actively help them find their places. And what do I mean by that? We should hire them. I get that with church planning, you're like, I've got two people on my staff. When am I supposed to hire this person? I would say as soon as possible. Now, it doesn't mean that that is her whole job, but it should be in her job description. I want you to have eyes on the spiritual health of our women and be thinking actively about how I can help you make sure that they stay healthy. Not, you go over there and keep the women happy. Advocate for them. When you see a woman who has gifting, you tell other people about it. She needs you to give her room to grow. You buy her cover for anyone who's looking at her like, is she here to take over? Does she want to preach on Sunday? And you're like, no, she's flat out awesome. And if she leaves, I leave. Give her some credibility. Pursue her to serve and lend her credibility by publicly celebrating her gifts. So 
just understand that the barriers for women in the local church are many. Uh, one of the things about women is that we are willing to volunteer and volunteer and volunteer and volunteer at the rate of a full-time job until Jesus returns. Will you dignify our work? Will you show others that the worker is worthy of her wages? Or will you presume upon her availability to do so? You know this, you know you have women in your church who are working three times as hard as some of the men you're paying. When are you gonna dignify that? And then are you gonna pay her less because she's not the primary breadwinner in her family? What are we talking about here? I wish we could stay here all day, but we can't. Plus you're like, stop smacking me in the face. <laughs> what I want us to have is a recaptured vision for the church as the family of God. And too often within our churches, though we may speak the language of family, we operate as a single parent authoritarian home where the father makes the rules and the children all get in line. But if the church is the family of God, it's a place where there are fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters, and the kingdom advances when they work together.